All right, good evening. This is your Chief Executive Officer, Doug McGregor. Uh, we have a really a special program this evening. We have the opportunity to listen to someone that all of you know and uh, really respect, as I do, for his wisdom, his understanding, his balance, and most importantly, his integrity. Uh, and that's Judge Napolitano. Andrew Napolitano is a well-known figure. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about him, although I hope this evening he'll talk a little bit about himself. Some of you have asked questions about him in the past, and hopefully he'll illuminate us about his uh, early life that helps explain why he's where he is now and why he believes the things he does. So tonight is a conversation with Judge Andrew Napolitano, and with that, uh, I will immediately turn to Judge Napolitano and welcome him and invite him to open the program with the subject of Andrew Napolitano. No, thank you, Colonel. It's a pleasure. You and I have known each other for a number of years, going back to when I was at Fox and had a, a show for two years um, on, on which you happily uh, were a guest. Uh, and then the show went away and we remained friends. And then after I left Fox, you have graced me with your uh, presence in my present show, which is called uh, Judging Freedom. The show on Fox was called Freedom Watch. Uh, it was the second highest rated uh, show on Fox business, but it got under the skin uh, of too many political types who had too much influence with my bosses at Fox. And so they uh put the show to bed after uh, two years but it was a lot of fun and it was great uh, to meet you i think we actually met uh through a mutual friend of ours ron paul well you know uh, it's kind of interesting that you said grace uh, grace our presence you know nobody has ever said that i graced anybody's presence not even my mother so uh, <laughs> it's very kind of you to make that statement but uh you know we'll, we'll let that one go i'm not sure how the folks out there are going to take that I guess uh, I guess West West Point guys don't use that don't use the word grace as a verb. <laughs> there may be some now, but there weren't weren't any in my class. I can tell you that, and we were anything but graceful. Well, anyway, uh, so I was um, uh, I was born in Newark, New Jersey, on June 6, nineteen fifty. Uh, my parents were um, first generation uh, Italian American, blue collar. My father uh, spent three years in the United States Navy in World War II. And when he returned in 46, by, in 1948, he and my mother got married. They had been childhood sweethearts, best friends uh, since they were four years old. They were born in the same city block three days apart, November 5th, 1925, November 8th, 1925. My father loved, sorry, Colonel, the Navy, the New York Giants, Notre Dame and the New York Yankees. He was an Italian American sort of uh, version of an American, an American life. Uh, he had two employers his entire adult life, the United States Navy and what was then called the New Jersey Bell Telephone Company, which became uh, Verizon. Yeah. He was always fascinated with electronics. He taught himself electronics uh, and eventually rose to the ranks in Verizon to where he was teaching electronics to corporate executives so they would have a, a good understanding of it. My mother, who has no education beyond high school and who recently celebrated her 98th birthday, instilled in me my love of books and my uh, voracious appetite for reading. She did the same with uh, one of my uh, brothers uh, as well. I played football in high school. It was a large public high school, the same high school that my parents attended, and I had many of the same teachers. I won a full scholarship to Princeton University. I worked my way through law school at the University of Notre Dame, tending bar and uh, waiting tables. At the end of law school, I practiced law in Newark, New Jersey, with a large Wall Street-style law firm, and I was kind of bored there doing research for other people. So I went to a smaller firm at which I learned uh, the ins and outs of trial practice and was very drawn to the uh, courtroom. Uh, I also got involved in Republican uh, politics in New Jersey. And by meeting the, the right people and uh, associating with the right clients, a time came when the governor of New Jersey uh, called me up and said, I'm looking for somebody who's young, has a, an ethnic last name, an Ivy League education, 
and wants to make the judiciary career. Oh, and by the way, being a conservative is helpful too. Mm-hmm. It was Tom Kane in New Jersey. Judges are uh, appointed. Tom, uh, still living, is and was a moderate, anything but a uh, but a conservative. But he was a, a, of the mindset that he needed conservatives on the bench. In New Jersey, one is appointed to the court by the governor, confirmed by the state Senate for seven years. If reappointed before the end of seven, you have it for life. So Tom Kane gave me my first uh, appointment, and Christine Todd Whitman, another moderate Republican, gave me uh, my lifetime uh, appointment. On the bench, I underwent a radical transformation of my views from being a conservative to being a libertarian. Uh, and taking rights seriously. I've written some essays by that title, uh, believing that the Constitution means what it says. Uh, And uh, this, of course, came uh, to the dismay of some people that had put me on the bench, and certainly to the dismay of prosecutors in criminal cases, uh, because, again, of my belief that without the Bill of Rights, we, we are nothing. Uh, we would just become a a totalitarian uh, society. Uh, I tried 150 jury trials, uh, probably uh, 75 civil and 75 criminal, roughly. Uh, While on the bench, I was chosen by the chief justice to lecture to all the other judges on changes in the law. I gave those lectures all around the state to uh, lawyers as well. Uh, A year into my lifetime appointment, I got a little bored and decided I would leave uh, the bench and go back into uh, private practice. I was in private practice for a year uh, when I I met a wonderful human being by the name of Roger Ailes. And uh, it was just a chance meeting through a Princeton um, classmate of mine. uh, And... uh, I'm a little ahead of myself here. Actually, I met Ailes when I was still on the bench. When I left the bench, I held a press conference, uh, and I used some one-liners in that press conference that Ailes read about, and he called me in, and he said, uh, you know, there's this trial in California that's about to start, and I'm thinking, hmm, maybe I'll put my own judge on air to second-guess this sort of nutty judge that's trying the case. Have you ever heard of this judge in California? He's saying to me by the name of Lance Ito. Of course, I've never heard of Ito. And of course, this was the OJ trial. Roger at the time was the chair and chief operating officer of CNBC. So I worked for Roger, as did many uh, Fox people, by the way. Neil Cavuto was there and um, Geraldo Rivera was there. I worked for Roger for a year at CNBC. Um, I was at their studios in Englewood, New Jersey, and a uh, reporter became a dear friend of mine, actually performed his wedding a few years later when he moved back to New Jersey by the name of John Gibson, uh, was in the courtroom. And a couple times a day, Gibson would come out of the courtroom and out of the courthouse, and we would have a conversation on air about the case. Well, the case went on for a year. We all know the outcome. Uh, At the end of the OJ trial, uh, Microsoft and MSNBC for, and, and Microsoft and General Electric formed MSNBC, and they did not offer Ailes the presidency. And so he quit CNBC and formed Fox with Rupert Murdoch and brought a lot of us uh, over with him and basically said, you know, I don't know where this is going to go. This thing could collapse in a year, and I'm not paying any of you. So if you like me and like the work and, and believe in me, we'll see where it goes. I was still practicing law because all of this was uh, part-time. Um, I took to it very well. It liked me. I liked it. I liked Roger. And one day he looked at me and said, I see you on other networks and that's got to stop. And the only way I can stop it is by paying you. So he began paying me with a piece. And then he called me in. He said, this is ridiculous. You're driving us crazy. The bookkeeping is killing us. We can't keep track of how many times you're on air and who booked you and what budget it is. This is nuts. So I have to hire you uh, at at a, an incoming television rate, which is very generous. It's probably more than a four-star general makes, but that's the way television is. Everybody's overpaid. Uh, so that began my uh, 24 years there. Uh, after about two years, I stopped practicing law. Uh, they gave me an office. They gave me an assistant. They gave me a producer. Uh, I was on air uh, probably uh, five times a day. Um, 
um, five days a week, uh, 11 months of the year for 24 years. You do the math, that's about 14,500 times uh, on air. As Fox's chief legal person, I was um, involved in every legal story that Fox covered from the impeachment of Bill Clinton uh, to the first impeachment of Donald Trump. And I was the center uh, of all of those stories because I was the only full-time person there who was their legal analyst. I began my day at 4.30 in the morning, getting in uh, at 6 and starting at Fox and Friends in the morning and going throughout the day. Sometimes I had regular assignments. Sometimes um, uh, I didn't, and they just called me the last minute. I also, um, while on the bench, now I'm backing up, uh, taught constitutional law uh, and legal philosophy at uh, Seton Hall Law School in Newark, New Jersey for 11 years. Prior to that, right out of law school, I taught um, at Delaware Law School in Wilmington, Delaware, where there was a nutty a character who was um, adjunct on the faculty. Uh, we all liked him as a person, but he had no business being at a law school uh, faculty. He was a local politician, and they were trying to give him a little extra income, Joseph R. Biden. This is a while ago. Uh, my uh, last teaching assignment was four years at Brooklyn Law School, where the dean was a, a Princeton buddy of mine, and he hired me uh, to teach constitutional law and legal philosophy uh, as well. So between uh, lecturing to law students and explaining the law uh, to jurors, I've uh, developed a knack for explaining the Constitution, the principles and values that underlie it, um, as well as uh, technical aspects of the law so that people can understand it. When I was at Fox, I used to say, so the beer and pretzel set could understand it because that was basically what our idea was of what the Fox audience was. I'm not critical of Fox. It developed a huge uh, audience in a short uh, period uh, of time. But the idea in explaining these things to a general audience is to think about the beer and pretzel set. One is not arguing to the faculty of West Point or a Princeton University. One is not uh, explaining the law to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. One is explaining to the law to people who may change the channel if they don't understand what you're saying. If you don't do it with a little bit of humor and with some uh, lesson that they're going to take uh, away with them uh, when they leave uh, the, the room that the television uh, is in. So I had 24 very happy years. Uh, at Fox, uh, Roger left, Roger died, new management came in and it got rid of a lot of us uh, that were 70 and older. Uh, I think there was some animus to get rid of me as well because of the perception that I was this insufficiently pro-Trump. Of course, Fox's uh, uh, Trumpism would cost them $787 million uh, in a crazy lawsuit that they were told they would win and they ended up settling for fear that a jury would order them more than that because they were saying things that Trump wanted them to say uh, for which there was no uh, basis uh, at all. Since I left Fox uh, in, in large measure because of you, Colonel McGregor, my uh, podcast has really taken off and it's gone from 93 subscriptions the first week to 265,000 subscriptions. Uh, that's on YouTube. Um, Facebook has gone from 250,000 to 500,000, uh, and Twitter's up around 750, 800,000. All these things are uh, very, very gratifying. We uh, regularly reach, again, in large measure to you, um, a million and a quarter viewers a week. Now, to put that in perspective, that is more than some of the newer cable uh, companies uh, like TBN, Trinity Broadcasting, uh, News Nation, and even Newsmax uh, regularly uh, achieve. My audience is anti-state, uh, anti-war, uh, anti-economic uh, regulation. It is a small government, maximum individual liberty uh, audience. Candidly, Again, because of you, Colonel, 
<clears throat> I have veered into foreign affairs, an area in which I've always had an interest, but it is not my expertise. My expertise is clearly the Constitution of the United States. I've <clears throat> testified before Congress on the Constitution. Excuse me. But uh, there is a great interest in Ukraine. There's a great interest in Israel and Gaza. There's a great interest in uh, what these wars and the mentality that are supporting them are, are doing to uh, the debt, uh, doing to personal freedom, and doing to uh, the government. And um, that has struck a chord with, uh, with a lot of people. So I'm, I've spoken about myself a little bit longer than I should have, but that uh, not at all. Listen, in a nutshell is, is me. Uh, oh, I'm not, not married, never been married. I'm in very good uh, shape. I work out uh, aggressively 90 minutes a day, three days a week, both cardio and uh, lifting and stretching uh, with a trainer. Uh, I'm very strict about uh, what I eat, and I sleep like a baby about seven and a half hours a night. Well, that's In fact, it's almost my bedtime. <laughs> I'm, I'm not suggesting we should terminate this. Well, I was going to say, yeah, we're, we're going to try and keep you up a little later here. Uh, obviously, it's pretty hard to avoid the topic of persistent warfare right now because it's become right. almost a staple of American life. I wanted to mention something. You know, I've always admired men like your father who, who master things through personal per perseverance, interest, and sheer intelligence and understanding, the way he mastered electronics. Because I can tell you in my household, I had two semesters of electrical e engineering, and my family won't let me near a light socket. <laughs> and, uh, I took virtually nothing of value away from it. In fact, I needed a case of no-dos to get through it. Well, we used to say if my father can't fix it, it's not broken, particularly if it involved uh, electricity or electronics. I honestly think that all that stuff he taught himself and all those things he taught people that wanted to advance themselves in the company, including corporate executives, mm -hmm. is now well past us because of the uh, high-tech advancement of all that. But in that era, the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, uh, what he taught himself and what he uh, taught others was very valuable uh, mm -hmm. to the company, to the shareholders, to the executives, and to his colleagues who were able to be more productive for uh, the telephone company. Oh, absolutely. And there was a time in this country when the CEO CEOs of major corporations were drawn from the ranks of engineers who began life on assembly lines. They've been replaced by lots of uh, financial officers. One of, the reasons, one of the reasons I loved Roger Ailes so much is Roger would walk into a control room. Now, a control room for a 24-hour-a-day television network looks something like NASA or the Kennedy Space Center, just aisles and switches and screens and everything. Roger would walk in and knew how everything worked and could manage it and could take charge. He could be the senior executive producer in there or the lowest level person there and knew exactly how everything worked. It was and very, cool. very, very impressive. I've I never met anybody else in television that knew as much about the technical aspects of it as he did. And it wasn't necessary for him to know it, except his own mind. He didn't, he didn't want people working for him that knew how to do something unless he knew how to do it also. No, and that's what made him such a success. And he's an interesting person. And whatever people say about him now, they, they should not miss the fact that he was a man who really understood the market and his audience. Yes. I mean, to the point of near genius. And yes. the people that he selected, like you, to come and work for him were wildly su successful. There's no question yes. about it. Yes, One of the things I'm wondering if you would talk about a little bit, several members have asked a question. You've interviewed and worked with lots of interesting people through your life, both while you were practicing law, when you were on the bench, and when you entered into this new phase of your life on television. Can you talk about perhaps the, the one or two people that you met and talked with that you found particularly fascinating for whatever reason? Uh, well, I think of two people right at the top of my head. Uh, one of them I think you know or knew. He's no longer with us, and that's Donald Rumsfeld, who was a horrible person and a terrible fraud, but I enjoyed very much dissecting him. I remember interviewing him 
uh, on live television. We didn't tell him we were going to do this. We put up a picture of him shaking hands with Saddam Hussein, and he was just livid, and it was making all kinds of grumbling noises to the PR person with him from the Pentagon. Why didn't you tell me this guy was going to do this to me? When it was over, I shook his hand. I said, you know, Mr. Secretary, from one Princeton man to another, and he wouldn't put his hand out to me, really was not very happy with the interview because I had uh, exposed him for the uh, lover of blood uh, mm -hmm. that he was and the absence of uh, moral standards uh, in, in his work. The other person I remember very much doesn't have very many moral standards either, but he's side-splittingly funny, and that's Howard Stern. So I met Howard Stern <laughs> when he was a defendant in my courtroom. Oh, and he wanted to kill me because I ruled against him and I made him reveal his financial data to me. He, he pretended he was Dr. Kevorkian one day on television. And he made up a number for people to call him and tell him how to kill himself. And it was somebody else's number. And this lady uh, ran a business and she, she rented chateaus and villas throughout Europe. She got 15,000 of the most disgusting phone calls you ever heard. You know because I listened to the tape. Okay. Time to get in the courtroom. It's the basis for punitive damages yeah. because they asked them to stop making this thing and, and the network re-ran it. And so I ordered him to furnish me with his financials because in a punitive damages case, the judge gets to see the financials of the defendant so he knows how much to punish the person by. Eventually the case settled. Stern wanted to kill me. And then he got fired by CBS. <laughs> and Ailes said to me, here's your chance to kiss and make up with Stern. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, here's Stern's CBS contract. Read it for me. It's this thick. It's an inch thick. I read it. He goes, did they have a right to fire him? I said, yes, but they still owe him 250 million bucks. He's going, you're going on air tonight to say that. So I go on air and I explain, this is Howard Stern's contract. CBS owes him 250 million bucks. Well, he suddenly became my best friend. He came <laughs> over to Fox to be interviewed by me all the time. He had me on his radio show uh, continuously, and uh, we became good friends. So those are the two most uh, unforgettable people uh, that I've, uh, I've interviewed. Listen, I've interviewed uh, Netanyahu, uh, but uh, these two uh, stick out, Stern and, um, uh, and Rumsfeld, more than anybody else. Well, how did Bibi Netanyahu receive your questions? So uh, I was um, on with O'Reilly, and you know, there's this area right outside uh, the studio called the Green Room, just a generic right. word. It's not always green for where you get makeup on and you sit and wait till they call you. And uh, walk into the Green Room, and there he was. He was in one of those interregnums between prime minister so he was not the prime minister he stands up george napolitano and goes to hug me and the bodyguards are pushing me away and he's swatting them away like they're flies this is what the jewish people want to know and i'm thinking, what is he going to ask me about due process first amendment now you'll know when this was by what he said to me he says to me is michael jackson innocent or is he guilty oh God. Oh, Lord. So I'm going, you know, the trial's going on. I said, well, in my opinion, the evidence of guilt is overwhelming, but I don't think a California jury will convict him. I will report this to the Jewish people. <laughs> then I guess he enjoyed the uh, encounter. Uh, and so we had a number uh, of uh, interviews uh, over a monitor. Obviously, he was in Israel. I was uh, in New York. They, they're they not memorable to me. He was not the prime minister at the time. Israel was not uh, fighting a war at the time. Uh, he, he obviously did some research on me because he was talking to me about libertarian uh, economics. Um, I know he did research on me. I'm sitting at a dinner party and the guy next to me is the uh, uh, consul general to uh, Israel. And we're talking, talking, talking. And he says to me, you know, my daughter just graduated from um, USC law school. It's a very fine law school. And she doesn't want to take the bar. I said, well, that's a mistake. She should take the bar. What is she doing at USC? Well, we were assigned to LA and she was born in California. She's as American as, as you are. Would you meet her and uh, talk her into passing the bar? Um, 
at this point, Netanyahu is prime minister. The prime minister would be very happy. I said, well, yeah, I'll meet your daughter. I'll meet your daughter. I meet the daughter. And we have lunch, beautiful woman. And she starts telling me things about myself. I said, what, what is this all about? She goes, well, you know, I was in the IDF. Yeah, we all have to be in the IDF. I was in intelligence. Yeah, I was assigned American media. Yeah, one of the people I was assigned to research was you. So is this just a coincidence that you and I are talking like this? No, no, no. My father really does want me to take uh, the bar exam. All of those are my only encounters with uh, uh, with Netanyahu. The the incident in um, O'Reilly's green room, a couple of interviews on air, and then this encounter with, uh, I don't even remember his name, the then general consul from Israel to the United States who was in New York and who was at this dinner party. The dinner party was hosted by Tony LoBianco. I don't know if you remember him, the French Connection, the, the, an actor, American actor, yes. and his wife. They're very active in uh, sort of conservative Republican politics in New York. Mm. <laughs> Not many people are, but they are, and mm. they would have these uh, dinner parties all the time. I think I'm astray from what you've asked me. Remember what you asked me. Oh, the two most... Memorable well, interviews. You got a bonus. You talked to us about uh, Netanyahu, and uh, my impression of him, he, and I'm sure this is true for his daughter, is he's exceptionally bright person. There's no question about it. Correct. Correct. But, and, you know, and, whenever I've been in Israel, I've had Israelis tell me, "You realize that just about every other Israeli citizen is an informant for the Mossad or Shin Bet or one of these intelligence organizations." And I said, "Well, if that's true, that's virtually the whole population. They all start breaking out laughing." Right. Uh, so that, that it's an interesting it's an interesting place with a lot of very smart people in it uh, yeah. who have very strong opinions of just about everything. And I'm sure uh, Netanyahu is that way as well. Well, one of the things I want to get back to, you mentioned the Bill of Rights. Our members, <clears throat> you know, express a lot of concern about a range of issues. But one of those is the Bill of Rights. And I've, I've had discussions with them, and I've spoken in various places, and I sometimes have to tell people, yeah, I think the Constitution is a wonderful document, but we've lived in a post-constitutional America probably since FDR was president. And they all look at me strangely. But the, the truth is we haven't upheld the Constitution nearly as much as we should, and I don't see that improving. But I said the one thing we absolutely have to fight for that is our lifeline is this Bill of Rights. And I was wondering if you'd talk a little bit about that as perhaps the keystone in the edifice that makes us Americans, because there are very few nations in the world, Britain's a good example, that have a true Bill of Rights. Britain has none. Right, right. But Britain has a constitution with a lowercase c because it's not a written document. It's not the Magna Carta. No. By the way, there are 10 Magna Cartas. It's not any of them. It's their tradition, which, of course can change on a dime if uh, Parliament wants to. Theoretically, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land here and is supreme even to Congress. The Brits don't even make a bone about that. In Britain, Parliament is the supreme law of the land. Uh, king or queen, whoever it might be at the time in the modern era, always goes along with Parliament. So when teaching the Bill of Rights, I would always uh, begin early on I would start by going through the, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution line by line. There's no other constitutional law professor has done it. You tell the students to read the Constitution, they're just going to tell you they read it. If you go through it line by line and give the history of each line and the values underlying each line in the document, then you know that they have a basic uh, understanding of it. You know, I was, I'll just tell you a funny story. I was interviewed for the Supreme Court of the United States twice by Donald Trump. Once before he was president, because he knew he had that vacancy since Justice Scalia had died and President Obama did not succeed in filling the vacancy because the Republicans in the Senate, uh, thanks be to God, did not uh, confirm Merrick Garland uh, to that seat. Uh, and then once after uh, Justice Kennedy uh, retired. So interviewing... Um, Donald Trump. He is the president elect at this point. It is Christmas time uh, of 2016. Uh, and I was alone with him for a long time. And uh, I said, you know, in, in a month, you're going to take an oath 
to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Yes, yeah, so they tell me. I said, have you read it? And he said, no. Why would I read it? I don't read books. I said, no, 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 Mr. President, it's not a book. Depending upon the size of the print, it's about 22, 23 pages. I don't need to read it. I got people like you to tell me what's in there. Mr. President, I think you should read the Constitution. Okay. He doesn't read the Constitution. I'm on my way out of the um, meeting, and Chuck Grassley, who's the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, said, did he just interview you for the Supreme Court? Yes. Well, Republicans on the committee have voted to authorize me to hire you. We'll pay you a fee if you will give him instruction in the Constitution. I said, are you kidding? It would be 2,000 one-minute long lessons. That's about the extent of, of, uh, of his ability to concentrate on anything you're saying to him. You guys are stuck with him. I can't teach him the Constitution. I, I, I talked to him on the phone when he asked me a question. First day of law school after going through the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. So we're at the third week in now, I say. So everybody knows the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. What would be the state of the freedom of speech if the states ratified an amendment repealing the first? Would we still have the freedom of speech? Now, almost every hand was up and said, well, no, we wouldn't because there is no First Amendment. I said, well, that depends on your value judgment. Do you believe in natural rights or do you believe in positivism? Do you believe that our rights come from our humanity and our humanity is a gift from God and we have these rights because we are human beings? Or do you believe that the law is only what the lawgiver says it is? Now, at this point, they understand the two basic schools of thought. There are 10 of them, but they're in basically two categories, one of natural law, the other of positivism, which is basically force. It's whatever the government uh, says. So if you believe that our rights are natural to us, then we still have the freedom of speech, even if there is no First Amendment. On the other hand, if you believe that the government has the final say when it comes to human rights, then if the government repeals uh, the First Amendment, then we don't have uh, the freedom of speech. And you can, of course, go from one through eight going through the various rights protected by the Bill of Rights and make uh, the same argument. I have often uh, argued uh, that because our rights are natural, that we have them whether they are articulated in the Bill of Rights or not. And the purpose of the Bill of Rights is to remind legislators that there's a backstop on how far they can go in writing law and to remind judges that there is a place where the legislature can't go. And the whole purpose of an independent judiciary is to be anti-democratic and to restrain the majority when it wants to crush the rights of a minority, whether it's one person or whether it's a, a, a group of persons lesser uh, than uh, the majority. So you're right. I'll start to go through them. I won't go through all of them. You're right to think as you wish and say what you think and publish what you say your right to associate or not to associate, your right to shake your fist in the tyrant's face, petition the government for a redress of grievances, your right to assemble or not to assemble, to worship or not to worship, your right to defend yourself using the same mechanical means that the government and the bad guys use. At this point, and I stop and say, Second Amendment was not written to protect your right to shoot deer. It was written to protect your right to shoot tyrants right. when they take over the government. Ask Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. Your right to due process, your right to own property, your right to life, liberty, and the ownership of property, all of these things are guaranteed in the Constitution. But a guarantee is only as good as the people in whose hands we place the guarantee for safekeeping. And as you pointed out, Colonel, since the FDR uh, years, in my opinion, 
the third worst president in American history after Lincoln and Woodrow Wilson. But in the after the from and after the FDR years, the Constitution has become a joke. What used to be uh, liberties guaranteed are now liberties mocked. Mm -hmm. uh, the government does all kinds of things that allow it to right any wrong, regulate any behavior, tax any of it, transfer any any wealth, uh, the Constitution be damned. So um, here's a Murray Rothbard uh, story. You're at home one night, uh, relaxing. If you're most of the government, most of the public, you're watching television. If you're Doug McGregor, uh, you're reading Stalin's War, <laughs> a thousand page, a thousand page masterpiece on right okay so i'm a third, of the, way, I'm a third of the way through it should be required reading in every college and university in the country it's spectacular yeah. uh, i read uh six non-fiction books at a time 15 minutes each at night before i go to bed and bed i read a historical novel for 15 minutes but then i'm i'm shot so <laughs> there's a knock on your door and you open the door and there's a two guys with a gun and they say, give us your money. We want to give it away in your name. <laughs> the hell is this all about? Stay right there. I'm going to call the police. No, don't bother. We are the police. Yeah. We're the IRS. We're here to relieve you of some of your assets so we can give it away in your name. Thank you, FDR. Thank you, Milton Friedman, for withholding taxes. That's what the government has uh, become uh, today. Judges spend most of their time trying to find ways around the Bill of Rights. There are some that are very faithful to it. The justice who got the job that I was up for, Neil Gorsuch, is the closest thing to a believer in the natural law and a libertarian, as you're going to find on the Supreme Court of the United States in the past 50, 60, 70 years, going back to pre uh, FDR. So there, there is that mentality uh, out there. Unfortunately, it is the minority. Most judges are prosecutors in black robes uh, who mm -hmm. give the government whatever it wants. Yeah. I mean, if you want me to address specific rights, I've touched on the First and the Second Amendment. I um, Well, I think those, those yeah. are at the top of the list and vitally important. You know, we have a, a number of uh, members who are concerned about the, the issue of religious freedom. Uh, that, uh, you know, the government tends to trample almost at will from time to time, and they worry about this growing worse in the future. A lot of people were very concerned about the decision inevitably to effectively uh, take away the, you know, the, the tax freedom from uh, religious institutions. In other words, to make everything liable for taxation, knowing full well that that would destroy large numbers of religious institutions. Correct. Uh, I believe that's coming. I don't know if it's going to be successful, but they're certainly going to try uh, for it. The uh, horrific, woke mentality uh, that manifests itself in the Democratic uh, Party uh, is growing rather than uh, shrinking. And there are more and more areas in which these uh, hardcore uh, lefty progressives think the government is not delivering enough, and I believe that uh, religion uh, is in their uh, crosshairs. I don't think that that would happen under the present Supreme Court, but the makeup of the present Supreme Court could change tomorrow mm -hmm. uh, if you know somebody resigned or somebody passed away or some a tragedy uh, like that um, occurred. Well, you know, Jim, in that connection, uh, our country, our choice is obsessed with the truth. One of the things that disturbs us is that we now no longer really trust most of the mainstream media. Getting the truth is something you have to dig for. And, you know, when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, we tended to look at the people, especially the anchors, whether it was Huntley Brinkley or Contrite or any number of different people, we tended to impute to them a degree of trust. We, we said, we, we think these men are going to tell us the truth unless somebody uh, shows us otherwise. And of course, those of us that lived through Vietnam watched that tragedy unfold and people attacked uh, men in the media who actually did tell the truth because it was not popular. The truth, as we both know, is not always popular. We want to get at the truth. We're trying to build a platform 
that uh, you know the investors they call it uh, fact-based news. Now, one of the problems that we have is that people also want everything instantaneously, and we just don't know. You know, when the first report comes in, the first report is frequently wrong. Right. So you end up playing catch up. Talk a little bit about truth in media. What are the obstacles to it? And tell us about how you think we at OCOC need to go about it. Well, I, I spent 24 years at a, a media entity where truth was not at a premium, but the, the spin and the direction that they wanted it to go was. It's one of the reasons I'm not there anymore. Um, not that I left, but they didn't didn't want me digging deeply into areas that I felt the public needed to know about. But this is not about me. This is about the mentality of the of the newsroom uh, today. Uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a newsroom that is totally dedicated to unvarnished truth that does not have any spin uh, on it whatsoever. And that's because of management and investors. If management and investors uh, want a, a neutral uh, recitation of facts, not, not bland, not boring, but neutral, and that it doesn't take uh, sides, uh, then you'll hire people who will uh, deliver that. It can, and it can easily be done. It is not characteristic of journalism. Journalists are the most opinionated people in the world today. And many of them think they're a lot smarter than the people they're uh, they're covering. Of course, uh, we we all know that. I mean, you mentioned Huntley Brinkley and Cronkite. I mean, you and I are the same vintage, roughly, and uh, we were raised on that. And we all thought they were telling us the truth, and it turned out they weren't. In some cases, they didn't know that they weren't telling us the truth. In other cases, they were part of the cabal that uh, that misled us. My heroes are people like Daniel Ellsberg and Julian Assange and Edward Snowden, mm -hmm. rather than uh, the banner headline reporters for the New York Times or NBC or CBS. Well, let's uh, face it, the ruling political class, which uh, frankly includes much of the media giants, the people that own it and uh, invest in it and rule it, that ruling class thinks of itself as uh, essentially uh, the Brahmins inside an Indian caste system. Yes. So they, they are above everything and they yes. know what's best. That's a huge problem. Well, I, wanna, I, I have to wrap up here, uh, not because I know you're anxious to go and do great things tonight, but uh, you've been very generous with your time, spending time with us. There is one point I want to make on the way out for future reference, and you can quote me. General officers are overpaid, Judge. So don't worry about that. They definitely are overpaid, as are most bureaucrats in Washington. And yet there are too many of them. Oh, good lord! Yes, absolutely. I don't. I don't know what people like Marshall would think. Well, I guess I do, and they would be shocked at the numbers that we have in the senior ranks, and yeah. wonder what I, had happened. Yeah, I gave uh, Roger. This is well. Yeah, it was well after I was established there. Uh, two uh, autographs, photographs, one of uh, Patton and one of MacArthur. And Roger's uh, dream house that he built was in Garrison, New York, right on the other side of the Hudson River, yeah, right across looking the West Point. Point. Yeah, so right. Roger used to have 400 people over for a, a big party with a large orchestra and fabulous food on the 4th of July. Hmm. And we would see the West Point fireworks. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. From the top looking down, no, rather no. than from the ground looking up, because he was on a mountain that was higher than West Point. And he would always say, don't get me wrong, I don't look down on the military. I look <laughs> up at the military. This is just a piece of earth that I live on. Well, you've seen more of them than I have. I think I got to see them twice. Uh, the rest of the time, I was unfortunately in some other place doing something I probably didn't want to do in the heat of the summer. But that's another Great. story. Yeah, well, Judge, we were very much want to bring you into the OCOC family, and uh, that's that's one of the reasons we wanted you here. But we also just wanted to know more about you. Our members wanted to know more. We're up to a hundred thousand. Uh, wow. we're, we're growing by fifteen hundred a week. And oh, I think, I'm jealous. I didn't know the growth was. Uh, forgive me for interrupting. I didn't know the growth was that rapid. That's terrific. And I think uh, in the future, when we actually market effectively, and that's what we're working on right now, we haven't really spent money on marketing. 
that tells you something about the people out there who are equally frustrated with this two-party system that delivers the same bad policies, regardless of whomever is elected. Correct. But no, we, we definitely want to do that. And you were kind to tell us more about yourself. And that's what a lot of our members want to know about. And your, your story is an inspiring one. I mean, I don't know very many people with your background that ended up with a scholarship to Princeton. So, uh, you know, that's that's I had to fill the Italian quota. I did have a, a, a classmate. We were in ROTC together and somewhere is a picture of him saluting me, which the, the picture will be worth a lot today his <laughs> name is, because his name is Sam Alito. <laughs> oh, really? He's a good friend yeah. Well, he's a great man and oh, a man of character. He's he really great. is. Yeah, well, I was so dumb. I had to, to take a year off at the Virginia Military Institute which sometimes I thought was going to kill me. And that's why I went to VMI before I went to West Point. I had played too much in uh, my last years in high school and my time in Germany. So I had to pay the price. All but, right. And you ended up with a PhD in, in military history. God love you. Well, actually international relations, but that's not a here to there. I always tell everybody, don't, don't be too impressed with degrees because thermometers have those too. And you know where we stick those. <laughs> so anyway, Thanks a million, Judge. Appreciate it. And God bless you. And we look forward to hearing from you in the future, wherever you go, whatever you do, and hopefully at some point with us. Thank, Thank you, Colonel. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. It's our country. It's our choice to make a brighter day for America. Let the power of